Okay, so welcome to this next video on uh, the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis. Okay, so so far what we've seen is that if you suffer DNA damage, P53 levels will go up. P53 will then lead to increased uh, expression of these two pro-apoptotic BH3 only proteins, Puma and Noxa. Puma and Noxa will then lead to the formation of um, pro-apoptotic BH123 aggregates in the outer membrane of the mitochondria, which will then release cytochrome C. Cytochrome C will then bind to the apoptotic protease activation factor 1, or APAF1, and cause this uh, caspase recruitment domain to be released from that binding site, because cytochrome C will uh, displace it, basically. Now what can happen is these APAF1 proteins, now with their exposed caspase recruitment domains, uh, can aggregate together to form a structure known as the apoptosome. Okay, so let's see the structure of this aggregate. So they're going to aggregate together. Okay, and the aggregation looks like this. So this might take a while for me to draw. So you have around um, seven of them generally in this apoptosome, like so. And then um, they're coming out like so. Right, so all of these um, APAF1 proteins, these apoptotic protease activation factor 1s, are now going to aggregate together, and it's the card domains which aggregate together. So that's why that's really important, uh, that that uh, domain, that card domain, that caspase recruitment domain, has been exposed, because if it doesn't expose, then you can't obviously form this aggregate here. Okay, so here is the apoptosome, like so, and all of these APAF1 proteins that have come together to make this great aggregate, they all have cytochrome C bound to them. So here is the cytochrome C uh, in their uh, binding site. So cytochrome C there, cytochrome C, more and more cytochrome C. So the cytochrome C being released into the cytoplasm has driven the formation of these large complexes, which are known as apoptosomes. Okay, and these apoptosomes now are going to recruit another protein, because at the moment we haven't actually talked about caspases at all. So uh, caspases are the essential enzymes of apoptosis. They are what actually break down the proteins of the cell and cause apoptosis. So in order to get apoptosis to begin, remember, what we need is to activate a few caspases, so-called initiator caspases, which will then set off this positive feedback effect where they activate more caspases, uh, and then those caspases then activate more, and you just get an overwhelming positive feedback effect where you get far too many caspases, and then that massive uh, activation of caspases is then capable of destroying the cell. Okay, so we need to get the activation of a few caspases. Now, a specific procaspase also has a card domain. So let me draw this procaspase. So here is our procaspase, and it is specifically procaspase 9. So remember, the caspase family of enzymes consists of 12 members, uh, 12 slightly different members, and... Um, Caspase 9 specifically has a card domain at its uh, amino terminus. So this is a card domain, a caspase recruitment domain. Okay, right. Uh, so let me colour it in green. I should have done it in a circle like the other ones, but it's basically meant to be identical to that caspase recruitment domain on APAF1. I just haven't drawn it the same. Okay, so this is Procaspase 9. And Procaspase 9 is specifically the one that has to be activated because only it has this card domain, basically. So this is Procaspase 9. Okay. In the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis, all the other 12, uh, sorry, all the other 11 types of caspases are also going to be activated, but they're not the ones that initiate it. They are, uh, Procaspase 9 is the one that initiates it. It's the one that initially gets activated. Then you get these, uh, it gains its proteolytic activity, and then it uh, breaks down the other caspases, the other procaspases, to uh, make them into functional caspases so that you can then get this caspase, cas sorry, this caspase cascade. Okay, 
Right, so let's just recall the different domains of the procaspase. So this domain up here is what's known as the pro-domain. Okay, uh, this large bit in the middle is known as the large subunit of the procaspase. Large subunit. And uh, this portion here is known as the small subunit. Okay, so what's going to happen is that this procaspase 9 with its caspase recruitment domain is going to go and bind to the center basically of these apoptosomes. So let me just color in the different portions of the procaspase 9 first. So the pro domain is in pink, the large subunit in orange, and then we'll have um, the small subunit in red. Here. Yeah. Right. So in goes the procaspase into the apoptosome, basically. So it's going to come in here behind, like so. And now I've changed the way I draw the card domain so that it fits with the card domains in there. Okay, and here is our procaspase 9 now drawn in here. And not just one of them, loads of them. Another one's going to come in here. It would just take too long to draw one coming in all over the place. But you'll get loads of them coming in to this um, apoptosome, basically. Okay, so let me colour them in. So the pro, the pro domain we had coloured in pink previously. The large subunit we coloured in orange. So here's the large subunit. And the small subunit we coloured in red. Right, so there's the procaspase 9. And then the card domain right at the tip there is coloured in orange. So now what's going to happen basically is that you're going to cause the proteolytic cleavage of um, this site here, i.e. the binding between the procaspase 9's prodomain and the large subunit, and you're also going to cut here. So all procaspases have these two uh, proteolytic cleavage sites. So um, one is between the prodomain and the large subunit here, and one is between the large subunit and the small subunit. So, what's going to happen is that binding to the apoptosome is going to cause the cleavage of those, um, those two uh, proteolytic cleavage sites. So, what you're going to get is you're going to get large subunits and small subunits being produced. Okay? And what will happen is these large subunits and small subunits will then uh, bind together to form an active caspase 9 enzyme. Okay? And in order to make an active caspase 9, you need two large subunits and two small subunits. So let me draw them aggregating together. So you'll get two of these, so two times the, the small subunits, and you'll need two times the large subunits. And you'll then form an active caspase enzyme, like so. Okay. So here's our active caspase enzyme. Right, so the small subunits in the middle here and the large subunits out the side. So this is how we will show our active caspase 9 enzyme. Okay, and this now is capable of activating other caspases. So, it's, it's a functional caspase. I want to stress this. That there's no difference between the initiator caspases and the, um, and the uh, uh, executioner caspases. The problem is, you've activated a tiny little number of caspase nines now, and they are not capable of destroying the entire cell yet. Uh, you've got far too many of, far too few of them, rather, to destroy the entire cell. I would compare it basically to excitation contraction coupling in the heart, where um, you get, upon excitation of the sarcolemma of the cardiomyocyte, you get a little bit of calcium coming in from the extracellular fluid, but that calcium is not capable of making the cell contract. It, it, calcium does make the cell contract, but you get far too little calcium coming in uh, from the extracellular fluid to actually uh, cause the contraction of the cardiomyocyte. Instead, what happens is the calcium activates the type 2 reanidine receptor, and then the type 2 reanidine receptor opens, releasing calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and therefore massively amplifying the calcium signal. So, um, it's the intracellular release of calcium that then causes the contraction of the muscle. Similarly, these caspase nines are kind of like that calcium coming in uh, from the extracellular uh, 
of space, basically. They are capable. They, they, you know, there's nothing wrong with them. They will uh, proteolytically cleave proteins, but there's far too few of them to actually kill the cell. So instead, what you need is a positive feedback loop. These are going to activate more caspases, and you're going to get massive recruitment of caspases, and then together they're all going to... Um, going to um, cause the apoptosis of the cell. So, how do these initial caspase nines that you have formed, how do they lead to the formation of more caspases then? So let's draw our um, caspase nine enzyme here. Okay, so we've got this active caspase nine enzyme now, so I'll just color it in again. And basically what it's gonna do is it's going to be, well, it's in the cytoplasm, and it's going to um, activate loads of procaspases that are within the cytoplasm, basically. Okay, so here's our active caspase 9. So this is caspase 9. Okay, so basically, uh, in the cytoplasm of the cell, you have absolutely loads of procaspases. So let's say this is a procaspase here. Okay? And uh, procaspases have these two, cat um, two proteolytic cleavage sites. So they can be cleaved here between the prodomain and the large subunit, and here between the large subunit and the small subunit. Okay, and um, let me just label this up. So this is the small subunit here. And um, this is the large subunit subunit, and at the top there we have the prodomain. Okay, so this is the prodomain. Okay, so basically in order to activate this pro-caspase as it is to an active caspase, what you have to do is you have to cut at these proteolytic cleavage sites. So, uh, caspase 9 is capable of cutting these cleavage sites basically. So, what's going to happen is um, you are going to free up these large subunits, which I'm going to denote in green, and these small subunits, which I'll denote in pink. Okay? And then what can happen is that you can, uh, if you're producing lots of these, if you're cleaving lots of procaspases, what can happen is they can build together to make active caspases. So you need two large subunits and two small subunits again to make an active caspase. So just like in the case of Procaspase 9, the only thing special about Procaspase 9 was it had that um, that uh, caspase recruitment domain uh, um, on its amino terminal basically yeah, before the prodomain and that allowed it to be recruited by the apoptosome. But basically it's just a normal caspase apart from that. So, the way in which caspase 9 leads to an amplification of the activation of the caspases is that it's going to go and perform these proteolytic cleavages between the protomain and the large subunit of procaspases and the large subunit of small and small subunit of procaspases. That will lead to the formation of many more active caspases. So basically, what's going to happen is when you've produced a few caspase 9 enzymes, they, that will be enough to kickstart the whole thing off. They will start converting procaspases into active caspases, and once you've made these active caspases, they'll catalyze the reaction of more procaspases turning into ca active caspases. So you get this massive positive feedback loop, which is going to lead to the activation of all of the procaspases which are sitting in the cytoplasm of the cell waiting. And then once you've got a massive concentration of active, procas uh, active caspases, they will then uh, have enough force to dismantle the cell, basically, and cause uh, apoptosis. So that, overall, is how uh, you trigger the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis in response to DNA damage, which is not, um, not, going, not uh, successfully being repaired.